Ah, uh, book by book. And John's Gospel. That's what we've been doing here at All Souls Church in Langham Place for the last oh, 10 sessions. This is the 10th one coming up right now. And uh, this is the last time we'll be doing John. Of course, we've done a number of other books. We've done oh, all sorts of different books of the Bible. And this is one of but a series. But John's Gospel has been very, very special for Paul Blackham here and for Anne Graham Lotz, who's our illustrious visitor from the United States of America. We're very honored to have had you on these studies, Anne. And now, and Richard Buse, that's who I am. And here at All Souls Church, we're about to embark on the last one. And we've been taking all sorts of themes, of course, as we've gone through John. We've done Jesus revealing the Father, and we've done him teaching those friends by the lakeside, and we've done him working his great works. We've done him feeding those people, if you remember, and uh, loving and dying, and now rising and living. Christ living and us living in him too. So as we look at John 20 and 21, these two chapters, that's what we're going to do. I think I better start by reading a little bit just from chapter 20 and why don't I start, I think, at verse 19, the first Easter Sunday. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And I think that's enough for the moment for the reading. We'll come back to some of this. Um, and Graham Lotz, I mean, we come now to the reality of what Jesus has been teaching all the way through the Gospel of John. How does it relate to... Ah, oh, the new birth for Nicodemus, or the woman at the well with, uh, you know, thirsting for the new life, or for the, um, the new eyes for the blind man, all of that. How does it relate? I think it relates in the sense that everything we've studied in the Gospel of John, everything that John has told us, and all the promises that God has given us through the examples and the implication as well as the direct words of Jesus are absolutely true. And it's what sets us apart from every other religion in the world because our Savior and Lord is alive and He was raised from the dead. I can't imagine anything more dramatic than that Friday evening when they took that crumpled, mangled, bloodied, tortured body that was now dead and buried it in Joseph's tomb and then sealed it and put a guard around it to make sure nobody got in and nobody got out. And early Sunday morning, you know, the Bible doesn't quite describe what took place but early Sunday morning, there was an earthquake, and maybe that was the power of the resurrection itself. And then the guards who were standing around, you know, snapped to attention, they were looking, and, and an angel descended and rolled away that stone as though it was nothing. Mm -hmm. And there was, when they looked inside, there was nothing and no one inside. Jesus had already been raised from the dead. All that's these more, early verses of chapter 20. Yes, more than just yeah. a miracle. That is, that's never happened before, you know. And Ephesians chapter one tells us that in, when God got good and ready, he raised his son up through all the principalities and powers in that visible and invisible world and raised Jesus up and seated him at the right hand of the Father and put all authority under his feet. So it's not just that he's alive, but he is alive in authority over everything. Mm -hmm. And that our Savior is alive today, preparing a place for us as he reminded us in John chapter 14. And one day he's coming again to receive us to himself. So all that we've discussed is absolutely true and our sins are forgiven. We can receive new life and that eternal life is guaranteed to us through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We can live in the presence of God within us in the person of the Holy Spirit, looking forward to going to heaven when we die because Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive and the resurrection is the, you know, it's the most stupendous fact in the universe. It's extraordinary when we think about it. What does it mean for those disciples to see Jesus after the the resurrection, Paul Blackham. I mean, what can we learn about the new creation from these episodes here in the room and with Thomas and the fish, you know, yeah. in the, chapter 21? Well, I think what's so amazing about it is that so, what is our future hope? It's not an airy fairy thing. It's a very concrete thing that God's great creation, the Garden of Eden, 
this fantastic creation that he pronounced to be very good. He doesn't discard it and say, well, well forget all that physical creation. It's a low, you know, in the end, we don't want that. No, what the resurrection shows us, this is the physical resurrection of Jesus. Sometimes people have said, oh, well, we can't really believe in a physical bodily resurrection. Really, that's too far-fetched. Perhaps he lives on in just some sort of spiritual form. But no, this is the amazing thing. They get to touch and handle Jesus even after the resurrection. And then when he makes this fish breakfast for them, it's such a physical activity. <laughs> that it's you, that, look, cooking. A ghost <laughs> can't make them a fish breakfast. And he eats some food yeah. as well. So it's like he's so affirming to say, no, the resurrection is real. Bodily resurrection is your future. And in a sense, as he stood them, and he stayed with them for these weeks and they were able you know, to inspect the future, look at the future walking around in front of them, their own future, and to say, you know, so John's very excited about the fact that he was touched and handled and able to say, you know, they could go into the world and say, we have literally seen the end of the world, what it looks like, and he walked about in front of us. We know what resurrection morning's going to look like because we've seen it for, with our own eyes. It's, I mean, that is an incredible thing, and we need to meditate on that resurrection future all the time because that is what will get us through any suffering and persecution no matter how severe because that glory is so great so wonderful that future so it's a great chapter to meditate the on. resurrection and eternal life i mean eternal life and the forgiveness of sins mm. you know what a thing the gift of the spirit eternal life the forgiveness of sins oh. uh, when uh, there's a bit about forgiveness here and in chapter 20 and verse 22 mm -hmm. 23, um, if it's only God who can forgive sins, what does Jesus mean when he says here that the apostles can forgive sins? Well, I think it says the apostles present the gospel of mm. Jesus Christ. And as they preach the, the good news that your sins can be forgiven and that you can uh, receive Christ by faith and the Holy Spirit can come into you, you can be born again, you can have this new life that Paul has described. And when they preach it, if somebody reaches out and takes it by faith and receives it, then that gospel, in a sense, applies to that person and they're forgiven of sin. So in a sense, it's just an indirect way of saying that you forgive somebody's sin. Actually, the apostles didn't forgive their sin. No. Their sin was forgiven because they responded to the apostles' message, which is the gospel. Mm. And that great whosoever aspect, you know, whoever, whoever turns, is forgiven. Paul, you'd chime in on that, wouldn't you? Oh, well, I would, and, and, and I've used this very verse to be able to say to people, I, you know, Speaker's Corner in London, outdoor evangelism like that, and people said, well, you know, I'm, I'm going to be all right before God because for whatever reason. And because of this verse and the authority that the gospel gives, not just some Christians, but all Christians, this is the authority of the gospel, able to say to that person, no, your sins are not forgiven. You, you do not stand right with God. I say that on the authority of the gospel and Jesus Christ because you do not trust in him. And alternatively, in times I've been able to say to a person who's very worried, I'm saying, but you do trust in Jesus Christ. Yeah, of course I trust and love Jesus Christ. I say, I can, I, on the authority of Jesus Christ, I tell you your sins are forgiven. You stand right before God. That's the authority of the gospel. But that's the whole thing. It's the apostolic thing, isn't it? He says this to the apostles, and anyone who takes the apostolic teaching seriously and follows in the tradition of the apostles, then we are apostolic, and we also are able to use this particular privilege of pronouncing people, helping them to see that they really are forgiven by the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a wonderful um, honour that we have in this respect. Well then, Paul, if I just go on with you for a second, mm. can I? Yeah. Uh, what, what about Thomas? Oh, yeah. Now, Thomas, what lesson does he teach us? Well, Thomas, some people... Do you condemn him or do you... <laughs> yeah, you know, is he a hero or a villain? <laughs> well, of course, you know, the, the key thing is, he comes good in the end, but this business of doubting the resurrection, loads of people sometimes say, oh, well, Thomas, he's the disciple I respect that he won't believe any of it until he's experimentally proven and all this sort of thing. And actually, that's not the correct way to view Thomas. Jesus does not say to Thomas, well, I'm glad you didn't believe me or believe all the things I promised or anything. I'm glad you sort of would re refuse to yeah. trust me, but instead only demanded visual proof. Of course, that's terrible that Thomas did that. And, of course, and, he, and the thing is, as soon as Thomas saw Jesus, 
He, he hadn't got any real problems. Oh, my Lord and my God. And he was ashamed of himself. And the Lord Jesus said, well, Thomas, it's good that you've come good in the end. But more blessed are the millions upon millions and millions of people who, because of the eyewitness accounts of the apostles, will trust Jesus. So I think it's important... That, that applies to today, then, doesn't today, it? Today. We can't have Thomas as our model. Thomas's model is useless for the millions and millions of Christians down the years. The real model are the other apostles who believed. And Jesus is saying that's where the real blessing is, to trust him rather than trust to our uh, own senses or flesh or sight. Yes. But I think if there's a model in Thomas, it's a negative one yeah. because he postponed God's blessing mm -hmm. in his life for one week yeah. because he didn't receive the, the witness of the apostles. And we postpone God's blessing in our lives. When we refuse to accept the apostles' teaching or the gospel of John, then we postpone that blessing. We don't have the blessing of God until we receive it for ourselves. It, it, that's very, very important indeed. So there's Thomas. Now there's Peter also. Mm -hmm. We also look at Peter. I mean, here's this catch of fish, you know, 153 fish. They're all tilapia fish, by the way, in the Sea of Galilee. We used to catch them in, uh, in East Africa in some of the lakes there. The whole string of lakes all the way down to, into Africa, they have tilapia fish. That's what they were eating. That's what Jesus was eating. Mm -hmm. tilapia fish that day but now what about Peter he must have felt very condemned after the denial of course earlier on of Jesus how does Jesus restore his confidence and his purpose yeah. and all of that you know it's the sweetest interchange isn't it in chapter 21 yeah. but I think it goes back even because when uh, Jesus told Mary Magdalene the women at the tomb to go and tell his disciples. He said, go tell his disciples and Peter that I've risen from the dead. The disciples on the Emmaus Road, after they had confronted Jesus, they ran back to Jerusalem and they said, we've seen the Lord. He's appeared to us and to Peter. So somehow God, you know, Jesus must have revealed himself in a personal way to Peter that we're not privy to. But then in this chapter, chapter 21, Peter's told to go back up to Galilee. He gets impatient in waiting for Jesus, decides to go back fishing, and then has this encounter with Jesus on the shore of Galilee. And Jesus sits down with him beside a fire and gives Peter three times to confess his love for Jesus. Another whereas, fire. Yes, whereas before in the courtyard beside a fire, three times he had denied his Lord. Mm. So in a sense, Jesus took him back, you know, to those three times that gave him opportunity to set it right by confessing his love. And then he said, Peter, if you truly love me, if you even like me at all, if I'm even your friend, then you're going to do something about it. You'll feed my sheep, you'll tend my sheep, you'll feed my lambs. You just can't love Jesus and be complacent mm. and apathetic. You will be involved, you'll do something about it. And then in the end, <laughs> Peter, so he's just so like us, you know, which is why we love Peter so much, because he says, well, Jesus, what about John, you know? And, and Jesus turns to Peter and in essence says, Peter, John is none of your business. You follow me. Mm. And I think sometimes as we seek to live out our Christian lives, and maybe I suffer and Paul doesn't, and maybe you have a blessing that I don't have, and I say, well, what about Richard? And how come you did that to Paul? And how come I don't have... And Jesus says, Anne, they're none of your business. You follow me. Mm -hmm. So he ends this wonderful gospel by telling us to keep our focus on Jesus. That's very important. I mean, you know, we could say to ourselves, Who, who's called but Christ's call right there by the seaside? And, and he's called to us. And whose word but Christ's word? And whose flock? but Christ's flock. So if any of us are helping to minister to others, it's Christ's precious flock that we're ministering to, which is a huge uh, it's a mission that we're being given. It's a great honor. Well then, I mean, we're just about rounding off. What's John's picture of Jesus in his gospel, Paul Blackham? Well, it's just the staggering size of Jesus that we never get too big a view of Jesus. And every time we come to John's gospel, the perimeter gets pushed out, perspective gets bigger. From before the world began to long after this age is finished, the whole universe, however big it is, Jesus is bigger. Whatever historical events happen, he's bigger. He dwarfs them all. And we've seen that the history pivots around this life so that he made it all, he created the universe, he sustains it all, he directs it, and right in the middle of it all, he comes and he says, well, this is the fundamental problem with the world, and I'm here and I'm putting it right, and anyone can have my life, anyone can have my life, just trust in me, come to me, drink the water of eternal life. That's the vision of Jesus. And that's the message that we've been meditating upon. And here's, here it is in John 20, verse 31, the whole purpose of it. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. And 
Paul and I would like to speak on behalf of millions of people just to say how much we're honored to have you among us sharing in this program. We've all taken this step of believing in Christ. We've tried to share as best we can from the pages here of how we believe. And would it, this be the right moment? Somebody is coming to Jesus right now. I don't know who you are. We can't see you, but he can see you, and he's very close to you by his spirit. Would this be the right moment for some of us to put our trust in him for the very first time and others of us to underline the decision made maybe even years ago? Let me be chaplain, and we'll have a prayer now together. I'm going to pray it with the I word, me, as though you're praying it, and you can pray quietly after me. Let's pray now. Lord Jesus Christ, we followed these steps, portraying your majesty, your authority, your dying love, and your living presence. We thank you for John's gospel, and we thank you that it points us to putting our trust in you. So I, Lord Jesus, repent of my sins. Forgive me for the things that I've done wrong in my life. Forgive me for the supreme sin of not believing in you and keeping you out. Thank you for dying for me upon the cross to take upon yourself the responsibility of the sins that would otherwise shut me out of your kingdom forever. But you have died and forgiven me, and I accept your forgiveness with all my heart. I now ask that your unseen spirit, the Holy Spirit, will come into my life. And in doing so, I ask you, Lord Jesus, please come in. Come in today. Come in to stay. And I will tell others about this for the rest of my life and live for you always. These things I pray in your holy name. Amen. Well, I prayed that prayer myself years ago. So did Paul, so did Anne. If you've prayed it, would you tell somebody? You can find somebody to tell. I don't know who, but you'll know who. Or write a letter. Write into somebody and tell them and then begin. It's been an honor for us to share with you from John's Gospel. It's not the only book we've been doing. Next time, it'll be another book. God bless you. Thank you very much.